Welcome back to Questions with Crocker and my husband. Uh, Shane, how are you doing today? Better now. I'm drinking Mountain Dew. <laughs> he is addicted to uh, Diet Mountain Dew. You've seen the TikToks where it literally gets rid of like rust on tables, right? Probably could clean me out. It'd be okay. <laughs> I don't think that's what you want in a drink, uh, but that's all right. That's that's the worst vice that you have, I feel like. So True. I can handle that. Wait, what's my worst vice? Probably not a good place to talk about vices. <laughs> I, don't, I would have said like I'm addicted to coffee or something that's like that. That's where I was going with it. Oh, oh, I feel like you were hinting at something else. All right. We won't talk about vices, but we will talk about that. If you enjoy this podcast uh, with Dr. Crocker and her husband, Shane, make sure to like, share and follow us on whatever podcast platform you are listening to. Uh, we have a lot of great experience, knowledge, and we have some really fun questions that people send us. Some that honestly, we don't know the answer to, but we like to discuss them anyways. And we'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on them and any follow-up questions you have. So follow on social media, YouTube, uh, and make sure to follow the podcast podcast along and hopefully we get better as we go. <laughs> we're, we're learning. We're learning. We set the audio up by ourselves today, so we will see. We will see. We may not be recording right now, actually. <laughs> we are. We are recording. Yeah. Yes. I made sure of that. Don't worry. Okay. So we're going to do a little bit of this or that first. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So people always ask me if I wasn't a veterinarian, what else would I be. And so I wanted to ask you some job this or that questions. Are you ready? I think so. <clears throat> okay. So would you rather be a veterinarian or be on Wall Street? Wall Street. Would you rather live in New York City or live in the middle of nowhere? Middle of nowhere. Would you rather... Can I work on Wall Street and live in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> no. No. I this is the Warren point Buffett I'm... Did. This is it's the point I'm Omaha. making. Who, who did? Warren Buffett. He lives in Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, I think when you get to be Warren Buffett, you can live wherever you want. True. Would you rather be a real estate agent or an FBI agent? Probably FBI agent. I I felt that about you. You love to investigate things. I do. Yeah, you love to like Maybe find people calling. on social media. You like to learn about different cases. So I I could have seen that coming. So you could probably be an FBI agent, live in the middle of nowhere, and then just travel to like dangerous countries. That is not very appealing. Are you an FBI agent? And I just don't you know. Never know. <laughs> you look at me. I'm kind of a specimen of uh, <laughs> a scream. I do think there's a right test now. you have to pass. A physical, Probably. A physical Probably. test. <laughs> All right. So let's get into it. There is a question that I get asked more commonly than most, and it's probably because if you follow me on social media, it is not always clear. So a lot of people ask me, "I'm an emergency veterinarian. That's what I do." How in the world am I an emergency veterinarian and I own a general practice vet hospital? So I thought we could get into that um, a little bit and the journey and why I have both those things going on. And I don't think that it's something that is not realistic for people. I think that I just really like to think outside the box when it comes to what I do. And I have a lot of support obviously. So I am able to do a lot of different things. But uh, let me first kind of set up what I guess my week looks like or my month looks like to help people out a little bit. So I travel a lot. Yes, you would agree. Literally outside of being an emergency vet and on your own hospital. Okay, that that's valid. Uh, so I guess I also am a speaker and yes. travel. Okay, so even one more thing that I do. But Basically, I started doing more on social media a couple of years ago that turned into speaking engagements. And when I joined Veterinary Emergency Group, that's who I work for in the emergency room in Dallas, I was able to continue speaking and traveling uh, and doing that more and also going to more veterinary schools for them and doing a little bit of recruiting and marketing. So my job as an emergency vet does include shifts in the emergency hospital Um not as many as the other full-time doctors because I do some other things for the company. Yeah, so how many shifts in the ER do you work? I'm not allowed to say that. Oh, how, what's a typical ER vet work? So emergency veterinarians, it depends on the company you work for, but most of them work 12 to 15 shifts a month. That's pretty average. So 
we're kind of known for, you know, working hard and then we have a lot of downtime too, some to recover, but some also so that we can vacation. A lot of ER vets will, you know, batch shifts and be able to have a little more flexibility in their schedule. That's a big perk of it. Uh, But the shifts are long, right? So you're working less shifts, but you're working 10-hour, 12-hour, 13-hour shifts. Oftentimes it overflows into more. So you're definitely working uh, probably more hours, I would say, than a lot of general practicing vets. You're just working less days, which appeals to me because the flexibility. I love the fact that sometimes I work nights and I have days, you know, with my family. Sometimes I have swing shifts, so I have the mornings with the kids still, uh, and I am able to do all that because I do have the support of you who can be here as an entrepreneur to meet the bus uh, and do things. And you always say that I'm an emergency vet because I used to be. An equine vet. Explain that to me a little bit. Say that again. You always say that the reason I do emergency is because I used to be an equine veterinarian. I think it's probably more that you like the excitement and stuff going on all the time. I that mean, sense. yes. So there's a ton of ER vets that used to be equine vets. And what I think is, and this is my totally non-science theory, but what I think is, you know, when you're an equine vet, you're in a truck by yourself half the time, you show up to places, you don't know what's going to happen. And part of it is the thrill of figuring it out and just getting the job done. And I think that's completely what you do in the emergency room also. You don't know what's about to walk through the door. You don't know what you're going to have to handle. And you just have to figure it out. And that excitement is definitely a little addictive. Maybe that's one of my vices is the excitement and the craziness of the ER. So I When we started talking about buying a veterinary hospital, because I was an emergency vet first, and then this opportunity came up to buy the vet hospital, I was very reluctant to do that because I already had a job that I really enjoyed. True. But you also, prior to becoming a emergency vet, you were a GP practice owner or GP practicing vet that wanted to own their own hospital. True. Well, I wanted to- out, out of the left field. I would say I wanted to own a hospital from the time I was in vet school. True. Now, initially, it was probably going to be an equine practice. True. But as I changed from equine to small animal, I decided that <laughs> I probably should do a small animal practice, uh, especially just with the lifestyle, the hours, and financially, you know, how much money you can make owning um, a small animal practice. And so, living where we live. I mean, yes. if we wanted to move, then equine practice may make more sense. Yeah. And location really dictates a lot of what you do in this career. It is something that I talk to young veterinarians and students a lot about that. I love it when they say, I want to do this, but really it also depends where do you want to live yep. and does what you want to do align with where you want to live? Yep. 100%. So we had the opportunity to buy the vet hospital and I really didn't want to entertain it at all because I was already really busy. I was doing the emergency work. I was traveling and speaking. Um, And then you said, and this is, it's annoying sometimes, honestly, like these little things you say that stick with me and I can't like get them out of my head. But you said, would you regret it? Like, would you regret it if we didn't hear them out? I think I said, would you regret if somebody else bought it? Maybe that's And you missed the opportunity. Maybe, I mean, that's close enough. Yeah. You still made an impact on me. Yes. Like I'm giving you the win. So yes. like <laughs> take the win. I'll take it. I'll take it. But that stuck with me. I mean, I literally probably for the next couple of days just thought, yeah, I would be really frustrated if someone else bought it and I had missed the opportunity to own because I started to think that I wouldn't be able to own. Um, and I will be honest, we I feel like we're older. Um, I'm 42. You're Older than 42. <laughs> so I, I, I really felt- know how old I am. How old am I? 44? <laughs> you're 44. Yes. I felt like we had missed. 43? No, oh. you're going to be 44 in August. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. I know your birthday. What are you talking about? <laughs> I felt like, did you know Mother's Day is coming up? Izzy just told me. Okay. See? Yeah. Don't pretend like you know all the dates. <laughs> But I did feel like we had maybe missed the boat on buying a practice. And then I was in a mom's uh, Facebook group of veterinary owners, and I did a poll. And, of course, it's just a group of veterinarians. But I did a poll, and I asked how old people were when they bought their their hospital. And the average age was 45. 
So that kind of gave me a little bit of hope that I wasn't starting too late. And I mean, honestly, when you think about when people retire in this profession, you're not starting too late if you're in your 40s. Um, And so I love all the young veterinarians that want to be owners, but you have time, right, to figure it out. So we eventually started talking to them and we did a lot of due diligence. I didn't even know what due diligence was. Uh, So explain what that is. I mean, it's just the simple, this most simple term is just doing more in-depth digging of what's going on with the practice. So looking at the finances, looking at the actual um, real estate itself, um, understanding what is potential opportunity, uh, what are the costs associated with owning owning the practice, um, what are the other, you know, practices in the area, you know, what kind of competition do you have? I mean, it's really just digging deep into the opportunity and figuring out is it, does it make sense as a business investment or not? And that was really your sweet spot. That's where you shine because you do do diligence for a lot of different companies, a lot of opportunities. And I was more working through what would this look like if we bought it? And I think that was a lot of our conversations that we had over the next couple months. Yeah, I think we're definitely looking at it uh, from different lenses, right? You're looking at it as how do I as a veterinarian run this practice? I'm looking at it as this is a business opportunity. Doesn't make sense as an investment. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So. Well, and I think it's important to look at it both ways. Um, I just have different skills. And most practices, let's be honest, most practices that are owned by a veterinarian early on are going to be, they're going to work there full time yeah. because they don't want to pay another vet, right? You want to keep May that money. Afford to pay another vet. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we were lucky because the veterinarian who was there wanted to still work, but she just wanted to work a few less days. Um, and then I also was lucky that I have a large network of veterinarians that I know that um, I already started, had reached out about relief and um, helping out. And I do have flexibility in my schedule as an emergency vet, so I can be there yeah. occasionally if I need to. And so really the conversation revolved around my responsibilities at the hospital, and could I do both? And you, again, said, just because you own a hospital doesn't mean you have to work in it every day. And that honestly was like mind-blowing to me because my thought process is I own this hospital. I'm in charge of it. I want to make sure things are done the way that I want them done and maybe a little bit of like control, but I want to do it right, right? Like I don't see it as control. I see it as like I want to make sure things are done the right way for the team, for the own, like the clients, um, the pet owners. And you, <laughs> you basically are like, eh, yeah, you got to let that go. Like, well, I think just being an owner in any business, right? As an owner, you have to set the stage of what is my vision. Uh, what do we want the business to do? Um, what do we want the client experience to be and make sure that everybody that is a part of that organization understands that vision, right? As a veterinarian, you may wear two hats and you need to understand that those are two very different hats. One is an owner hat that is to share the vision and make sure it's getting done. The other is a veterinarian that needs to go practice quality medicine, right? And honestly, it's easier for me to be the veterinarian. Oh, 100%. I am great with clients. I'm a good surgeon. And that's why not every veterinarian should own their own hospital. True. Or they should have people that they partner with that that do get that part of it, right, and can do the business side of it. But I think I really understand better now after a year that – There's a lot of things I need to be doing as an owner that don't involve me being the veterinarian. And it is easier to fall back on, let me just see rooms, let me just do surgery. But really, the value I have is in growing this business and networking and getting the right team in place and the right culture uh, and setting us up for success in the long run. So it's a long game, right? It's not a short game. Uh, But it was very freeing to me, the concept of owning a practice but not working in it every single day. And I think when you look at especially people that own, you know, multiple practices, they get that. Yeah. And they're there to check in. They're there to measure the temperature of the practice or there if they really need to be. But they're not there every single day as a veterinarian. And I think one of the main ways you can burn yourself out really early on as a practice owner is to be the vet all the time and not ever leave yourself room to do all the other things you have to do as an owner. Yeah. Yeah, I think for sure. 
I think you can also burn yourself out if you're a veterinarian that's trying to do too much as an owner, right? So again, you have to remember there's two separate hats there and you may want just a one doctor practice with one or two, you know, technicians helping you out and keep it small and very low overhead and very less stress. That may work really great for a lot of people, right? Some people may say, well, I want to grow this into a, you know, three, five doctor practice. Maybe I want to own five hospitals down the road, right? Those individuals have to learn that they've got to shift more to the owner hat and a little bit less to the, you know, the veterinarian hat. Because there's only, there's only so much time in a day. I mean, I hate to say that and you hate to hear it, but there's really almost, there's only certain amounts of time in the day that you have to do stuff in. That makes sense. No, it does. And you often caution me against becoming the bottleneck where every decision has to be put through me. And that, again, has been a a tricky thing for me. I think it is a little bit of a control issue, but I think more so it's that I believe in, in the way that I want things done so strongly and the concept and the flow and the efficiency that having other people make decisions that don't align with that and then having to go back and like address that, it's almost harder than if I could just be there and make all the decisions. But I do agree that I would never be present for our family if I was doing that. Yeah. And I wouldn't be a good veterinarian in general if I was always doing that and a good owner in general. So it's been a learning experience for sure. But I do want to encourage people to think outside the box when it comes to ownership. And, you know, it may not be that you need to be the vet that's there every single day. And maybe it's a one you know, veterinarian practice, but that means you work there part of the time and you have an amazing part-time doctor or relief vets that help you out. Uh, And that- And and maybe you own a practice with two other doctors. Maybe maybe it's a partnership, right? Where um, there's three doctors that wear the ownership hat and you divide, you know, you know, certain- uh, job responsibilities between those three owners. Maybe yes. somebody's responsible for growth. Maybe somebody's responsible for, you know, hiring and HR issues. You know, you split those job duties up. So there's different ways to do it. Like you said, think outside the box and don't think that you have to fit inside of a mold that you saw your veterinarian or, you know, somebody do five, 10 years ago. And I do know, I know a couple of young uh, women practice owners and a couple of them have bought practices together mm-hmm. or, you know, been single practice owners, but had relief or had somebody else helping. And most of them actually had another job or another source of income. So uh, quite a few of them still picked up like emergency relief shifts because it helped with uh, cash flow. And that has been something that has helped us a lot is you know, what I get paid as an emergency veterinarian and through speaking really helps add to our income. So I don't have to take a large chunk of change out of the hospital and we can really invest and grow, put that back into our team, put that back into training, put that back into equipment and renovations, which I think is really important at this stage of the game. We want to grow quickly into what we know it could be because we bought it because there's a lot of potential. And if it stayed the same and wasn't changing, we would both be frustrated, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. And and again, everybody's um, path down this is going to be a little bit different, right? Yes. Ours is very much a you know, five-year window, and every decision we're making today is based off of our five-year vision, right? That may not be the case for everybody. Again, somebody may know exactly what they want. This may be a perfect fit for them. They're going to take as much cash out of the business as they can because you know, that's the, that's their vision and that's their plan. That's and the okay traditional too. model, like that's yeah. the way that everyone did it, right? Is like you bought a practice, you ran everything you could through it, all the write-offs you could, took as much cash as you could, and then you sell it, yeah. right, to somebody and make money. We're looking at it as setting ourselves up to do more than one hospital in the long run and build a team and an experience that we can replicate um, yeah. again and again. And this is kind of the test hospital to figure out what that looks like. And we're building the team that we think can make that happen. And honestly, it's been really exciting. And we've learned a lot along the way. And I think uh, one of our future episodes, since we're coming up on our one year anniversary, is going to be, you know, um, wins and then also things that we probably could have done, done differently. Better. Yeah. Could have, should have, would have. Yes. There has been a little more maybe wine drinking uh, this past year, but <laughs> we have survived. And I mean, I don't regret it. Do you regret it? Not all the time. <laughs> Today I paid a lot of bills. So. I know. Anytime you pay all pay all the bills, that's definitely frustrating. I think that for me, 
it's a realization of a dream that I had since I started vet school. And so even if it doesn't go perfectly every day, it's still mine. Yeah, I think that's the key, right? Everybody's dream is different. Yes. And you have to chase that dream, whatever that looks like. You gotta you've gotta be willing to take risk. You've gotta be willing to see an opportunity and um, take in some information and decide is that a good opportunity today or not and, and jump at it if it is. We're very unique in that we don't need a lot of information to make a decision. We process sure. information pretty fast and we decide yes or no, you know, pretty quickly and we don't look back and have regrets, right? So I think that's important for people to to think about while they're listening to this podcast is that they may not be like us mm -hmm. and that's okay, right? What we're doing um, fits for us. It may fit for them, it may not. But the fact that you're able to be an emergency vet, um, do speaking engagements, have a online presence, own a hospital, among other investments that we have, not everybody can juggle those balls and that's okay, right? Well, and I don't do any of it without a large amount of support. And that's 100%. definitely going to be in upcoming episodes because I get asked a lot, how do you do it all? And really, I don't. I don't do it all. And I don't always do it well. And so we want to be transparent about the struggles. But I think whether or not you work emergency and own a hospital, that's the reality, right, of being a human being and being a parent and being a partner. And so I think that... Hopefully, someone will at least think a little bit differently and maybe think outside the box with their next opportunity based off of this podcast. Um, and we are always open to additional questions. Uh, it's called Questions with Crocker because we want to hear back from you about the episodes or if you have something specific that you are thinking about uh, or you are struggling with in your career, we definitely want to see if we can help. So uh, you can reach out to me on any of the social media channels, on my website, drcrockerpetvet.com, and we'd be happy to answer things the best we can. Again, we're not experts. We're just a veterinarian and an entrepreneur, happen to be married, happen to be partners in practice. And made a lot of mistakes that we can keep you from making. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. One mistake I didn't make was marrying you. So yes. I am very thankful for that. We have our anniversary coming up soon. So talking about dates, we might need yeah. to, yeah, we need to think about that. <laughs> July? End of July. Yeah. It's coming up. Number so. what? 16? We got to do something. Is this year the beach renewal? No. Val renewal. No. <laughs> Is this like 17? 16? It's going to be, I think, 17. Yeah. So. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Again, make sure to like, share, follow, and uh, let us know what you want to hear about next call questions with Crocker for a reason, but don't ask a question you don't want the answer to because we are pretty open and honest. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye.